So what I'm going to be covering tonight um, is neural manipulation. So I'll be doing a little bit of an introduction. I'll talk a little bit about neural pathology and an anatomy review, treatment concepts. We'll do a self-palpation lab the best we can remotely. Um, and then I'll talk about patient examples from each of the level of the NM courses and what the course content is. So you have a better understanding if you decide that you are interested in this curriculum and want to take this curriculum. I will weave some research throughout and then discuss some more research at the end. So let's see how to advance this. That's the problem. There we go. Again, I did the introduction. A little bit more about me. I am certified in neural manipulation through the Baral Institute. I am a certified strength and conditioning specialist. I am nutrition specialist certified. I've been a PT for 21 years. I own integrated manual physical therapy where we specialize in visceral neural and vascular work. So the two other therapists with me, Leslie Bloodworth and Stephanie Gilbert specialize in this work as well. I have lectured and been adjunct faculty at Franklin Pierce University and Midwestern University. I'm a Baral promoter, which means I go out and talk about visceral manipulation and neural manipulation to educate people about the courses, about the treatment techniques, to increase an interest for the better quality of care for the patient. So that's the ultimate goal. I am a teaching assistant for them for multiple levels. And I've also spoken at multiple different situations with the APTA from the local to the state district meetings, to the public health meeting, to the, um, it was the state conference on visceral manipulation for pediatrics. And then I do other community lectures. So I'm excited to share this material with you tonight. I'm very grateful that you are here and interested in uh, learning a little bit more about it. So first, of course, I have to honor Dr. Jean-Pierre Barral, the founder of this work, who has been an osteopath and a PT for, I believe it's like 50 years. And he is still practicing in France. He um, is working part-time, which means he studies anatomy, works in the cadaver lab, writes his books, um, treats patients, and then he has an olive farm. He is a very humble, amazing man. He is gifted in his work. He is constantly studying and curious, and he is an inspiration for me. And so he developed the visceral and vascular, neural and manual articular manipulation techniques, and he's the co-developer specifically of, this, or, um, of the neural work and the manual articular work with uh, Dr. Alain Crobier. So the two of them um, usually come to the US once a year together and teach advanced courses. And they are an amazing duo. Um, they teach separately, but usually they're running multiple courses at the same time. And they have also co-authored books. So I put the images of these books. If you wanna take a screenshot or you want this information later, let me know. These are phenomenal books, the manual therapy for the peripheral nerves. So if you, because of COVID and everything going on, you are a self learner and you wanna read ahead, you can get these books from the Brawl Institute um, and read about them. The techniques are described in there. The concepts are described in there. I've read them multiple times. They're phenomenal books. So the peripheral nerves and then the cranial nerves. So the question is, who is this? So I put this image in um, because this is, does anybody know? Unmute yourself and say it. I know some of you know. I know. Who is it, Jen? Harriet. Harriet Cole. So Harriet Cole um, was the first human nervous system dissected out. And I have an image of her that's embedded on an artistic image in my office. And I have it there because I show patients almost every day her image and I like to pay her homage. Um, she was a 35 year old woman that was the housekeeper for the Drexel Medical College in the East Coast and she died of TB and rumor has it she said to the um, physician there do something great with me. And so Dr. I'll show you the next slide Rufus Weaver that's him took six plus months six to eight hours a day to carefully dissect her out and then he shellacked the nerves and she's still on display life size display at the college today in Philadelphia. And so I have her up to remind people of how interconnected the nervous system is. And so when we think of treating nerves, we often think of like a nerve is like one electrical cord and it's nothing like one electrical cord. It is much more like a cobweb of network of information that's constantly communicating back and forth, up and down through the whole system. 
So if you're looking at these images, there's Harriet Cole in the middle. Again, you look at the feet, the plantar nerves, they're connected to the sciatic nerve, connected all the way up to the sacral plexus, lumbar, the spinal dura, all the way up to the eyes, even our upper extremities and brachial plexus. All that tissue is one continuous tissue. There is no start and stop. There is no interruption. So tension anywhere in that system can be felt everywhere. So just like that cobweb, I like to think of a cobweb, our whole nervous system. And then the brain is like the spider sitting in the center, monitoring everything. And even the smallest mosquito way out on the tiniest little piece of that cobweb, that spider can notice. Just like the smallest pebble in your shoe, you can notice. So the brain notices these things. So our nerves are responsible for proprioception, for positional sense, awareness of our body, our senses, our smell, our taste, our sight, our ability to feel and touch. So all of those things are so important for us to have an awareness of where we are in space and to interface with the world around us. Now the fun little onesie outfits are there, again, to remind us of how everything is interconnected and how we can feel it. So if you look at the yellow onesie and you imagine anywhere there's tension in that onesie, the whole onesie can feel it. So if, if that person pulls up that stocking of that leg of the onesie really tight at the waist, you might start to feel discomfort in the toes and you think, oh, I have pain in my toes. But it's not the toes at fault, it's the fact that the whole system's pulled up at the waist and you actually need to loosen it at the waist and maybe unzip it a little and slide it down for the toes to stop experiencing discomfort and pain. And so Dr. Baral noticed that the system of the nervous system and our fascial system and this connection can give us clues to where there's tension or problems in the system. And so he started using something called general listening as an access point to feel into the body, to feel where there's lines of tension, to feel maybe where the tension point is, not where the pain point is, and to help the whole system be in better balance and better equilibrium so that the body can heal itself. He's very humble and he doesn't believe that we are fixing a person. We are here to help the person's body heal itself and live a little bit better in a, in a better way. So the image of the dog onesie over there and the ears I loved because think about touching your ears, like how much sensations on your ears. And so what's interesting about the ears is the ears are innervated actually by the vagus nerve, the trigeminal nerve and the facial nerve. And so if you're massaging or pulling on your ears, you can be affecting tension into the face, into the teeth, and more interestingly, that vagus nerve into the gut. And if you can tap into the vagus nerve, how you can affect the parasympathetic system and it can be calming to the whole system. So our whole system's communicating. The peripheral nerves are all communicating back to the central nervous system, all back to the brain, that sort of spider monitoring that whole cobweb. I love this anatomy image because we look at that. And again, you think of the vagus nerve as one nerve, but it's not, it's this network of nerves. It's all these anastomosis. So here we're looking at the anastomosis of the cardiac plexus. So the vagus nerve communication around the bronchus and the heart and how that interfaces back with the sympathetic chain and how it communicates up to the brain and down into the gut, into the celiac plexus, which you can see below the stomach and the liver area there, that mesh network of nerves. And again, this beautiful image of all those branches and anastomosis of the vagus nerve communicating with the intestines and going back and communicating with the kidneys, wrapping around the aorta, communicating down into the hypogastric plexus. So you have all these plexuses and ganglions and nerves communicating between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. And all that goes back in, back into that spinal cord, back into the brain and communicates. And all this tissue is continuous with the nervous tissue of the extremities. Again, there's no start and stop in nervous tissue. It's one continuous tissue. So I'm always looking in my anatomy books. Dr. Brawl inspires me. My patients inspire me to show them what I'm feeling. I show them um, Harriet Cole all the time. My netter's falling apart. I pull images out to show why I love this one. Let's look at what's familiar, right? So if you look at the sacrum and you see in the back there, you see the sacral plexus, those thicker yellow nerve branches. And that connects down into the sciatic nerve. 
So if we think of we have sciatica or sciatic tension, sciatic tension, that's traveling up through the sacral plexus, communicating back up with the brain. But if you look a little closer, that sacral plexus also has communication with the sympathetic chain, that little chain of yellow ganglion there. And it also has communication in the front part of it with the hypogastric plexus. So it communicates with the bladder and the rectum and the prostate. So the question is when you have a patient with sciatic nerve and low back pain and they start to get constipated, when we blame just the pain medicines, is it just the pain medicines or is it a relationship of tension in the nervous system that then you start getting dysfunction in the bladder and the rectum and or the patient that has bladder dysfunction or ulcerative colitis in the rectum or prostatitis or, 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 and then they start getting low back pain and sciatic nerve symptoms, which started it? Did it start in the bladder or the rectum? Did it start it in the sciatic? And how are they egging each other on? And how is that relationship causing dysfunction and problems for the patient? And how do we determine? So again, Dr. Baral, using this general listening where you're feeling into the body, it guides you to the main areas of restriction and tension ideally the areas where things started. And then they developed something called local listening, which is feeling into the body to feel very specifically where that tension is, where the mechanical problems are coming from so that you can start with and treat the right structures, again, to help the whole nervous system have homeostasis and help the body heal. This image was drawn by Jean Ann Zollers. She is one of the for all neural manipulation teachers, as well as the head of the neural manipulation program. She also teaches the visceral manipulation. She's based out of Albuquerque, New Mexico, and she drew this. And if you're looking at this image, we're looking at the cranial dura. So the black around the brain, there is the cranial dura. You have the falcs and the tentorium, and then it continues down the spinal dura all the way down to the phylum terminal of the coccyx. And so this tug of war between the top and bottom affect each other, a fall into the coccyx where the coccyx is really flexed, pulls on the phylum terminal, pulls all the way up to the cranial dura. So that cranial sacral balance can be affected. I like to think of the coccyx as like the rudder of a ship. It just can be off just a little bit and you don't notice it till years later, you're way off course. So deviations in the spinal dura and cranial dura, you might not feel and notice right away, but as your body has to adapt to these tensions and to the dysfunctions and creates compensations, and we pull slack from that nervous system from somewhere else, whether it's an extremity or your um, visceral organ fascia tension around the vagus nerve, somewhere that has to pull from, you start to have dysfunctions that are all really related to each other. So I love this image to sort of remind us of cranial tension and that pulling down in the system can be coming from the coccyx because the body will always want to protect the brain. So it's going to try to pull from the extremities and pull from the body to allow that brain to not have tension in it, to allow the brain to have good vascular supply, to allow you to function. And if we look at this image, we see the layers. We have the dura mater the arachnoid layer and the pia mata. And if you notice that, if you look out towards the nerve root, the spinal nerve as it goes out, those layers are continuous. So the dura mata continues into the nerve root and becomes the ep um, epineurium. So I'll go into that in the next slide, but just notice here how each one of those layers, they don't go away. They become part of that peripheral nerve. So again, the innermost layer, that is the endoneurium, that is continuum with the pia mata. And that is highly elastic and it helps separate the axons. The next layer is the perineurium and that's continuous with the arachnoid. And that really is a mechanical protection layer. It's there to contribute to the nerve's tensile strength and create sort of that protective cushion layer. It's collagen based. And then that outer layer I was talking about, the epineurium is continuous with the dura mata. And what's interesting about this layer, it's loose fatty connective tissue but it's full of the vascular, full of the arteries, the vein, the lymph, and the nerves to the nerves themselves. And then our outermost layer is the mesoneurium or the bed of the nerve. And this is the interesting layer for us in manual therapy in what can we do to affect this layer. So think of it as areas where there's tunnels or areas where the neighboring structures could be compressing against the nerve. 
And this is loose connective tissue that needs to have that slide and glide so that it can move, so that things aren't being compressed. So general information about the nerves, right? Look at the neural flexibility that that person has to have. How much slide and glide, how much elasticity does that nervous system need to have? We have 100,000 kilometers of nerves that all lead back to the central nervous system. So peripheral nerves, all leading back to the central nervous system. If you cut the nerve anywhere, it will retract because all of that nervous system's under tension. It needs viscoelasticity to be able to slide and glide and for us to be able to move, for example, into a position like that. And every time a nerve loses its elasticity, it loses function possibly. So you might start to get tighter and tighter and tighter. I like to think of this back to that cobweb. So if you have two tree branches and you have the cobweb between it, every time the wind blows, those branches move and that cobweb has to be able to give and move with the wind and the branches moving. If it's too much and it snaps, the cobwebs break and that spider loses its communication with its network. So we need to have that ability for the nerves to slide and glide and have some elasticity for movement and function. Nerves are highly vascularized. These are um, the, the vascular supply to the nerve itself is called the vasonervurium. And then they have a lot of sensory to the nerves themselves as well called the nervi nervurium. Any direct compression on the nerve can crush the vascular supply or the nerve supply to the nerve itself. And it is critical for the health of that nerve for it to have uninterrupted vascular supply and uninterrupted neural axonal transport for communication for the system. It needs to be able to slide and glide so that the physiology of the nerve is healthy so that the blood supply is not impaired and that it can communicate. The nerves consume 20% of the oxygen but only 2% of the body mass. So they're very reliant on having a continuous good oxygen and vascular supply. There's a beautiful image from Dr. Baral's book that shows the nerves in the arteries and the veins to the nerve itself. And then this is from David Butler's book. Um, and what I loved about this one was when you're looking at the arteries to the nerve itself, they have coil-like functions to them. So I like to think of them like little slinkies and they're all coiled up so that when you go to move and stretch and reach and the nerve itself is lengthening gliding, it can reach pretty far where the nerve has a stretch on it, but the vascular supply isn't overstretched and isn't compromised because those slinky-like coils can uncoil but still have continuous flow. So what happens if you start to put compression on a nerve? If the nerve has temporary compression, sitting for a period of time, leaning on your elbow for a period of time, you can create some compression, but it will recover. If it's continuous compression, it can start to impair function. So if there is continuous compression, you start to block intraaxonal flow, and that can lead to distal degeneration of the nerve. So I'm not gonna go into the depth of well area and degeneration, but compression can lead to distal degeneration of the nerve. If you completely cut and sever the nerve, then there is complete degeneration distal to where that cut was. So this is my little nerve example that I like to have. And if we take that nerve, it's a finger trap, it has a tunnel through it, it needs to have continual flow. If you create compression on that nerve, for a period of time and let go, it can recover. We need to be able to sit on our sciatic nerve, right? But nerves hate compression. If it's prolonged compression and the tissue around it can't slide and glide, it starts to cause dysfunction. So if you're compressing the nerve, you start to lose blood flow. So you start to get hypoxia. And then the response in the nervous system is you start to get some edema. So you start to see swelling in the nerve, okay? If it's there for long enough and persists, then you start to get fibrosis. So these are my little sort of demonstrative tools for you to see how a nerve itself can get fibrotic adhesions on it. 
in the Baral world, we call this a bud. So I'll be going back into this more, but it'll feel like a little grain of rice or a lump on the nerve, or it can be adhered to its neighbors. So in tunnels, it might become adhered to the neighboring um, fascia or bone or muscle or whatever's there. So let's go with something familiar. So you have a patient that has a disc herniation and that disc herniation starts to bulge and compress against your L4, L5 nerve root. So you initially start to get that lack of oxygen supply and the nerve starts to get irritated. Maybe you get some numbness and tingling symptoms that start to happen. If that persists and becomes more hypoxic, you start to get swelling. Maybe you start to have pain down that extremity. And if it continues on and on, that disc can become fibrotic and adhere to the nerve root. And maybe then you start to lose motor control. So that's a familiar scenario. One of the research, well, there's two different research articles that I read that talked about surgeons that took patients that needed discectomies and they had um, L4, L5 herniations that were adhered to the nerve root. So in every single patient, when they went in to do the discectomy and they looked, the disc had become fibrotic and the nerve root had become fibrotic. So they were adhered to each other. So the surgeons decided to do a little test. They took the patient, and they put the patient's leg in a straight leg raise position. So they put neural tension on the leg and then they measured the oxygen blood flow um, through the nerve and the axonal transport. And all the patients they looked at, that was diminished. So then they did the disectomy and they removed the adhesion and they removed the disc bulge and they retested the straight leg raise in all the patients. The vascular supply was, supply was improved as well as the axonal transport. So this shows us that if we can decrease the edema, decrease the fibrotic adhesions, that we can improve the function of that nerve. So could we then potentially influence areas where we can access nerves so that they don't get to the place where they need to have surgery? And so that would be the type of patient that would be a good candidate for neural manipulation. An example might be somebody that was in a car accident and the airbag went off and the airbag hit their face. So they started getting maybe facial nerve entrapment and they had swelling. And so the nerves started to become fibrotic and adhered and edema and they started to get symptomology. So this would be a good candidate where there's access points that you learn in the cranial nerve class, how to treat, and if you see in this image, that little bit of swelling, the nerve bud or the area where there's an adhesion to decrease the adhesion, to decrease the inflammation, to improve the blood flow, to improve the axonal transport, to improve the function and of the patient. So what are the type of nerve techniques that are out there right now? So for the last 20 plus years, the Neuroorthopedic Institute, the NOI Institute and David Butler have been talking about nerves in the US and they're fairly familiar. And I bring them up because I have to um, respect the awareness they have created about the nervous system. David Butler wrote Explain Pain, he wrote Mobilization of the Nervous System, um, and he's done extensive work with looking at neural tension tests, all the different kinds of tension tests, the different positions you can put them in, and sort of made the sliders and gliders famous. So neural mobility um, exercises, and there's lots of videos on that out there and resources out there. What's interesting, because I've read his book, is he does talk about in the mobilization of the nervous system, touching the nerve and treating the nerve, but somehow that never took off. Well, that's where Dr. Baral really and, and Alain Crobier really excelled. They are very focused on the actual manual treatment of the nerves themselves. And they have been teaching this work in the US since 1998, but have been doing this work overseas in France for the last 50 years. And so um, what's beautiful, I'm gonna talk about their approach is is the actual treatment of the nerve itself and the impact that can have on the system. So when a neural um, fixation occurs or a nerve is impaired, right? So we're talking about that nerve that has that bud or adhesion on it. You can start to lose gl gliding and length, right? So the nerve can't slide and glide. When that happens, the nerve starts to become harder. It has this sort of bud or hard zone the pressure within the nerve and around the nerve starts to become altered and the nerve itself becomes more sensitive and circulation and conduction is affected. So the analogy I like here is, is healthy nerves are much like that cooked spaghetti noodle. You just cooked it 
It's elastic, you can kind of stretch it. It has a firmness to it, it's round. If you put olive oil on it, which is the right way to eat it, then it's slippery and it can slide and glide. But if a nerve becomes adhered, it's more like that spaghetti that you took out, you put on the plate, you didn't put olive oil on it and you forgot it there and you, kept, you got busy with something else and you came back two hours later and it's stuck to the plate. And the spaghetti is a little bit harder and it can't slide and glide and it's lost its elasticity. So I like to think of dysfunctional nerves having more of that kind of texture to them where healthy nerves feel very elastic and pliable. And if a nerve is not moving well, like that nerve uh, stuck to the plate, or say, for example, it's your sciatic nerve stuck to the piriformis muscle. And normally you could sit down on a relatively hard, you know, bleacher and watch a game and you were just fine because your sciatic nerves could slide and glide and move out of the way so that your butt muscles could cushion you, right? But if it was adhered now and you sit on a hard surface, it's getting pinched between the surrounding structures because it can't slide and glide. And so then you start to notice, hmm, I'm having some numbness tingling in my leg. I'm having some pain down my leg. It's starting to bother me. You start to get paresthesias. And that nerve can become more sensitive with compression because it can't move properly through its surrounding structures. So in the Baral world, they have talked about treatment of that nerve itself and how to improve the mobility of that nerve. So the goals are to decrease the fibrosis surrounding the nerve tissue to improve, <clears throat> excuse me, inter and external neural pressure, to improve the vascularity, the axonal flow, the nerve mobility, to help that nerve and the whole nervous system, picturing that human onesie again, be able to slide and glide and move appropriately so we have better equilibrium through the whole system. What else I wanna add here before I forget? Okay. Um, the key concepts in the nerve work is that that one key one is prolonged compression, that nerve gets unhappy. So when you go to take these courses, you'll learn how to engage the nerve in a very gentle way without compressing and irritating it. So nerves dislike compression, but they like elongation. So they need to be able to lengthen and slide and glide. They, you'll be learning techniques where they get um, treated in fascial tunnel areas or along peripheral nerves, like I said, into the face where you might feel an area where there's a fibrotic bud. And again, you're treating the nerve with a compression decompression technique to wake up the mechanoreceptors. But again, when you learn this in class, it's not compressing all the way through and waking it up. These are very gentle when we go through the self-palpation techniques to just catch the edge of the nerve, to wake up the mechanoreceptors. So to bring back the spider web again, I grew up in a, a wooded area. So it was, I don't really love spiders, ironically. They kind of spook me out a little bit, but I'm still fascinated by them. And I would um, think of waking up the nervous system like you have that cobweb and there's that tunnel spider and you wonder if he's in the tunnel. And so you take a stick and you just very gently tease the edge of that web and the spider will come out. Right? So that's sort of the gentleness of these techniques. You don't want to destroy the spider's web. You don't want to hurt the spider in any way because they spent so much time creating this beautiful web, right? Our nervous system doesn't want any more compression or damage, but there's ways to just gently wake it up to get the axonal um, flow going, to get the blood flow going and to get that tissue around it. So the treatment's a lot about the tissue around it and making sure it can slide and glide well. And then working with elongation. So that's where, when you look at David Butler's work and why sliding and gliding, and I'll talk about that in the research a little bit, works is because when you can get those nerves to slide and glide, they function better. So just for you to move for a moment and feel some things in yourself, I'm just going to back up a little bit. I think you can still see me and the um, screen. I... Put these in here because in the clinic, so the Baral work doesn't teach nerve tension tests per se. They use a straight leg raise in some of the courses as pre and post testing and they talk about it. But I'm bringing it in here because this is a great place that's familiar to many of you that we use in the clinic. And I use these all the time as a pre and post test, one to see did I have an effect and two for the patient to have that awareness of something changed. So your median nerve tension test, if you do this on yourself, just take your right arm per se, depress your scapula 
So you're bringing in that brachial plexus tension and then you're extending the elbow and wrist and especially that first and second finger and you're bringing it up to the point where you feel neural tension. So that's a median nerve tension test. In the clinic, I like to measure the degree of abduction so that I have a baseline of when, and I'm doing this on the patient passively, when do I feel their system start to create tension? I correlate it with symptoms. Sometimes they're, it's pre-symptomatic or sub-threshold and I take them a little further and sure enough, they're like, oh yeah, that hurts. It doesn't necessarily mean I'm looking for paresthesias. I'm looking for where is their neural tension in the system. Radial nerve, same exact tension test position, except that it's pronation, the thumbs inside, you're bringing it up into abduction and looking at the sense of where, and what is that angle of abduction limitation? So that it's a way to have something to document and measure pre and post treatment. Again, lower extremity, straight leg raises are great, prone knee bends are great, all the different neural tension tests are great. Why does it matter? Why do nerves need to slide and glide? We need them for movement and for life. So this one I like to do, because I look at this traffic police officer, right? Bring one of your arms out into that median nerve tension test. So that full wrist extension all the way out. And then bring your other arm out sort of in the radial nerve tension test and start pointing and point and move that arm in different angles. And you'll feel how certain positions increases the neural tension on the other side. So we start to really see how the two extremities affect each other through that brachial plexus and how the whole nervous system is connected. And you can imagine you need that for any kind of sport, for dance, for movement, for life, whether you're trying to pick up your child, whether you're looking down for nursing, whether you're having to paint overhead, all these different things we need to be able to have extensibility through the nervous system. So when we're palpating a nerve, we want to always remember to be super light and gentle. So we say using flat fingers. So you're not getting in there and looking for a trigger point. These are flat fingers. Again, nerves feel a little firm, round like a string. They have mobility, but a little tension to them. And they tend to be slightly sensitive to palpation. So they might feel a little buzzy, a little like, ooh, I'm on something. Never push hard, you never wanna provoke a nerve. To me, that's like poking a stick at a hornet's nest. You don't wanna do that. So you always wanna be very gentle to the point where you can engage and say, yes, I think I'm on neural tissue, but not irritating it. So what we're going to do now is self-palpate. And so I will leave the, the screen up with me in the self-palpation. I'm going to talk you through this. I'm also gonna put anatomy image up on the next slide. But what we're going to be doing is feeling the median nerve, the ulnar nerve and the radial nerve and comparing them to surrounding tissues. So we'll be comparing the median nerve to the brachial artery and biceps tendon, the ulnar nerve to the bone and the fascia sling around it, and then the brachioradialis muscle to the radial nerve bud. So here we're looking at the radial tunnel and the radial nerve and the median nerve. So we'll do those first. So what I'd like you to do is with your dominant hand, that's your palpating hand. So whatever hand that is, your other arm is going to be resting on the table. So if I show you what I'm talking about, this arm is here resting so that you can have um, the tissue somewhat relaxed. And so just to kind of get into your palpating hands, what I'd like you to do is first just at the elbow crease, start to feel what the skin feels like. Can you pick that skin up? Can you roll the skin? How is the mobility of that tissue? So that's our skin layer. Then try to go underneath that skin and feel that biceps tendon. And once you think you're on the tendon, try flexing the elbow and feel that biceps tendon pop up into that. So you're very aware of what a tendon feels like. From there, drop the palpating hand down so that your fingers are very fat, flat and try to move the skin out of the way, go behind that biceps muscle, behind the biceps tendon, and feel the brachial artery. So find that pulse. That pulse is a beautiful guide for you to find. Once you find the pulse, try to soften to the point where you're at the edge of the pulse. So just before you lose the pulse, where can you play with feeling that artery? Go back in a little deeper, feeling the artery and the pulse, 
and then come back to that edge. Because when you go to find the nerve, that's what we're looking for is, ooh, yes, I feel that tenderness of a nerve. Can I go to the edge so that I'm not provoking it, but I still feel that I'm on neural tissue? From the brachial artery now, you're going to just go posterior medial, keeping your fingers flat, and just search. Search for a string-like structure that has that little bit of exquisite sensitivity to it. And once you feel that, your median nerve there, see if you can get a sense of, of feeling that nerve and coming to the edge of that sensitivity so that you're not compressing it too deeply. Again, I like repetition. So go out of that, go back to the brachial artery. Should be even easier for you to feel that pulse now. What an artery feels like, feeling the tissue and the interface of that fascia around the artery, going back and feeling that tendon. Back to the skin over the artery and the just posterior medial behind it, finding that median nerve, that sort of string-like structure that's a little bit um, sensitive that you notice and just keep it really light. So that is your median nerve. So now, since we have the image up, we're going to go over to the elbow crease laterally and feel that brachioradialis muscle. So if you bend your elbow, that brachioradialis muscle pops up and you can feel that muscle. About two and a half to three fingers down from the elbow crease, you can start to search, so let that muscle relax in that muscle tissue for a little teeny area that's maybe a little more sensitive. And within that, you're feeling for the radial nerve. And maybe in that radial nerve, you can feel a little like grain of rice-like feeling or a little nerve bud, a little fibrosity. Because we use our arms as specialist manual therapists so much, we so often have nerve buds here. So this is a nice place to learn that. Once you feel like, like for me right here, there's a little spot. Again, don't dig, keep your hands soft. You find that spot, flex the muscle again, pop yourself off of it and you feel the muscle. Relax the muscle, sink back in and feel that nerve bud, feel that sort of string-like structure that's maybe a little buzzy, a little sensitive. For our next palpation, we're gonna play with the ulnar nerve. So here, I like to again, sort of feel the skin around your medial epicondyle over your olecranon. We have that little extra skin to play with. So feel the boniness of your medial epicondyle. Skipping over, feel the boniness of your olecranon. And then in between, you can feel that groove. And if you let your arm be a little supported so things relax, you can feel that fascial sling that runs between it. So stay really light to feel the fascial sling. And then you can play within that groove or just distal to it or just proximal to it, searching for that string-like structure that has that little bit of firmness, roundness, a little bit of sensitivity, buzziness, that's the ulnar nerve. Most of us know this in a more aggressive way when we whack our elbow and it hurts like heck. See if you can find that very light sensation of what that is in that ulnar nerve. So in the classes, you will learn much more about how to treat the nerves. You'll learn how to assess the nerve mobility, where the restrictions are. You'll learn general listening and local listening to help guide you. Because say I have elbow symptoms and I find restrictions at the elbow, but how do I know that that's where I need to treat first? Well, in the classes, you'll learn local listening and different mobility tests to tell you, is it really coming from something down in the hand? Is it is it maybe at the hook of the hamate or a problem there with the ulnar nerve? Or is it something up in the axilla related to the brachial plexus? Or is it a nerve root at the neck? So all that's taught in the classes and you'll get much more there. So what I'd like to do now is, is talk about each level of the courses, some of the anatomy and things you'll learn and give you a patient example for each of them. Any questions before I move into that part? Okay, if they pop into your head, bring them up at the end. 
So when we're talking about neural manipulation level one, which is supposed to be coming to Phoenix, hopefully fingers crossed, in February of 2021, some of the techniques you'll learn here include the cranial and spinal dura. And I will tell you right now that these techniques I use almost every day in the office and for sure every other day, because there's always some kind of tension related to that and the nervous system in my patients. Again, Jeanne's image here and remembering how the falks and the tentorium relate to the spinal dura and the coccyx. So whether it's a problem with the coccyx, a problem in the spinal dura, a problem in the cranial dura, um, often people have so much history of traumas of whiplash, hitting their heads, falling on their tailbone um, that you often have to treat in these areas. You'll learn more specifically about the falks and the tentorium and techniques for that. So my patient example here was actually a patient that came to me with left sciatica, low back pain. And he um, had pretty significant back pain, hip pain, and symptoms down his leg. So straight leg graze was positive. His slump test was positive. Extension, of, extension slump, if you know what that was, was positive. Tremendous pain in his leg. And so through the guidance of the techniques Dr. Brawl teaches, which is general listening, local listening, it actually went into his cranial dura. So on the same side of his symptoms, I had to treat the falks and the tentorium and then treat the spinal dura. So here I am with a patient and I have to treat his head and neck to help his hip and back pain. And he trusted me and he let me do what I needed to do. And so that first visit, that's what I treated. And he stood up and he said, wow, my back pain is better. My leg pain is better. And when I retested his neural tension tests, they were all so much better and he couldn't believe it. And then he said, well, how, how is that possible? You have to treat my head to help my leg and back. And then I pointed to the picture of Harriet Cole on my wall and showed him how the cranial dura and the spinal dura is content, continuous with that lumbar plexus and sacral plexus, which is continuous with the sciatic nerve and the leg. And he was like, wow, I can't believe this. And so of course, in his follow-ups, he had a few more visits, I had to treat restrictions that had occurred along the sciatic nerve itself in his lumbar plexus, in his sacral plexus, even down into his foot because that prolonged irritation of the nerve. So when a nerve has compression and irritation in one area, it starts to become more reactive and sensitive in other areas. So often you find you have to treat that primary maybe starting point and then cleaning up all the little sort of fires everywhere else. In NM1, you also learn the brachial plexus. So you start to learn how to work with the brachial plexus at the nerve roots of the spine, which is beautiful and amazing to help with all the patients of yours that have upper extremity symptoms, neck pain, often that cranial dura and this go hand in hand. You learn techniques for the femoral nerve at the hip and the inguinal region, and that relationship between the inguinal ligament and how much it can compress the femoral nerve. And you learn techniques for the sciatic nerve related to the piriformis, glute, and lower extremity. Did I go the wrong way? Ah, sorry. NM2. So in NM2, you learn more about the brachial plexus. You learn how to treat it, what's called the supraclavicular region. So above the clavicle in near the neck and the relationship to the nerve roots, retroclavicular, so behind the clavicle, and then into the axilla. And for the patient example I'm gonna give you, really look at that axillary region here. And if you notice the brachial artery, you notice that the brachial plexus wraps around it. So if the brachial plexus is very tight at that area, it can almost act like a noose and kind of cinch down on the brachial artery. And so the relationship of neural tension to thoracic outlet syndrome and these areas of problems is huge. And so my next patient was a patient that had cervical ribs and thoracic outlet and upper extremity pain. So she had been seen by many other PTs in many other places and good PTs that tried to help her. Now they hadn't seen the x-rays and they weren't aware of her cervical ribs. And so if you look at this image, you can see her first rib above her clavicle and then you see two more cervical ribs above that. And so they felt the rigidity there and had tried to mobilize her first rib um, and flared her up tremendously. So she came in terribly symptomatic um, to them and then was even worse. So by the time she got to me, she was right-handed, could not use her right hand to type, 
to write, to brush her teeth or to eat. She was doing everything left-handed. She held it in, she was in horrible pain. And so it took quite a few visits to calm it down. I had to treat cranial dura. I had to treat the brachial plexus above the clavicle, behind the clavicle, into the axilla. I actually had to treat some visceral structures into her lung because that lung had sort of compressed up into the brachial plexus underneath the ribs there. I had to work with all the nerves down her arm and the vascularity in her arm. But she was able to fully resume, fully function with her arm, be able to go back to yoga. And that tells you how much she was able to then load through that arm. So it was quite amazing. In NM2, you also learn techniques for the um, dorsal scapular nerve, suprascapular nerve, axillary nerve, and radial nerve. So what I like to point out here is, is that the suprascapular nerve and axillary nerve actually innervate the shoulder capsule. So what's amazing about this is, is you can learn techniques that can help decrease shoulder capsule tension. So it's helping with shoulder pain, impingement, adhesive capsulitis, and all these problems that we struggle with. Um, this is an extra insight that can really make a big difference. You learn, of course, the radial nerve at different entrapment points down the arm, the median nerve, down different entrapment points on the arm, especially into the hand. I love this image to really look at how the neurovascular structures run together. And then of course the ulnar nerve as well. NM3, we're going into the lower extremity. So here you learn more advanced techniques for the sciatic nerve in relationship to the piriformis, sacrotuberous, sacrospinous ligament, and down the leg. You learn techniques in the relationship of the inguinal ligament to the psoas muscle and the nerves in front of it. So we're looking at the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the femoral nerve. Um, the patient example I'll talk about here was a patient that had left knee and hip pain and low back pain. Um, she, in the year previous, had fallen like six or seven times and needed a total knee replacement and then finally got her total knee replacement. And before and after her total knee replacement still had terrible back pain, hip pain and knee pain. And so with her, I had to treat all the nerves around the hip. So the femoral nerve, the lateral femoral cutaneous, obturator, saphenous, all of those nerves as they relate to the knee and the hip and back. Part of her problem was from all of her falls. If you take the visceral courses and you look at the psoas, the upper part of the psoas, the kidneys sit there and the kidneys sit in perirenal fascia anterior to the psoas. And in between them are the nerves T1, T2, or uh, excuse me, T12, L1, L2, L3, L4. And so because she'd fallen so much, her kidneys had a mild ptosis to them. They'd become inflamed and adhered to the psoas. The psoas was locked down. The nerves were being compressed. So I had to treat the lumbar plexus at the back, at the nerve roots as they were coming out. And I had to treat all the nerves coming down into that hip and knee to help her finally resolve her symptoms. So if you look at that femoral nerve and know that it is anastomosis with the saphenous nerve and the obturator anastomosis with each other, and that goes to the peripatellar plexus of the knee. So the complication of the total knee replacement had irritated the nerves from the bottom up. And then the kidney and the relationship to the psoas was irritating the nerves from the top down. And again, that obturator nerve, which actually innervates the SI joint as well. So for her, sit to stand and transfers were very painful. And so after we treated these, she was able to resume walking and transferring and sleeping and functioning without pain. When she came to me, she couldn't lie that leg straight. So she held her hip and knee in flexion because she was so guarded. And by the end of, I think it was like six treatments, um, she was able to lie her leg straight, return to full walking and everything. So um, it was really amazing to look at how the visceral and the neural work complemented each other. And then in NM3, you also learn techniques for the posterior knee. So with her, I also had to treat the posterior knee, the relationship of the um, tibial nerve and fibular nerve and sciatic nerve behind the knee, and also the vascular system in there. If you take the vascular, vascular classes, you learn how to treat the geniculate arteries behind the knees, which is huge for post-surgical knees. <clears throat> And of course, the tibial nerve as it goes down, the nerve and the tarsal tunnel. And then um, I love these techniques, the medial and lateral plantar nerves, which are continuations of the tibial nerve, continuation of the sciatic nerve. So back pain where you can have that thumbtack heel pain, treating the whole nerve together. But this, especially for plantar fasciitis and neuromas, if you know how to treat these nerves, you can have huge effects on that.
<clears throat> and then NM4. The cranial nerves, which are wonderful. You learn different access points to affect the cranial nerves. So you learn that the trigeminal ganglion, which is in this image, actually innervates the falcs in the tentorium. So tension in the teeth and chewing in the jaw can create tension in the falcs, tension in the tentorium, tension in the cranial dura. If you look at that there, you see the internal carotid artery and its relationship. So tension in this can then create tension in the vascular system. So migraines, ocular headaches, all this. So my example here was a, he was a, a physician um, under incredible stress working in the emergency rooms and he was terrible teeth grinder. So bruxism. So all night long he was grinding and he had horrible ocular migraines. And so we had to get him into a night guard to break that pattern because when the teeth hit and enamel hits, it triggers the trigeminal nerve like crazy. And then I had to do a tremendous amount of treatment on his tentorium, <clears throat> on his falcs, on his trigeminal ganglia and all the different branches, which you'll see in this image um, of the relationship of the trigeminal nerve to the eye, to the teeth, to the um, tension that occurs in the face and headaches when you have this situation. So I love this image because you can imagine why he had these horrible frontal headaches and eye tension and pain from that constant teeth grinding. <clears throat> and then cranial nerve five, which is the advanced nerve course, they sort of fill in with different techniques um, from olfactory nerve to glossopharyngeal to phylum terminal. My example here was phylum terminal. I was actually the patient example for this. I had fractured my coccyx years ago and had continued um, cranial, cranial nerve tension, dural, spinal neural tension. Um, and it wasn't until this class where my partner treated my phylum terminal, did I finally feel like my sitting tolerance improved. Like I couldn't sit in the shower to shave because my coccyx had so much tension in it. And that's not a problem anymore. So treatment of the phylum terminal, if you look at this image, you can see how it all, all terminates into the coccyx. So changing that tension relationship there changed tension in my whole body. So in terms of research, there is a research source page on the Brawl website, which is this is from that. If you want this, I can email it to you so that you can click on the links and read them. I've read all of these research multiple times. So the highlights for some of that um, I put here in short form. Um, I like meta-analysis studies because they're really looking at multiple studies and looking for trends. So this was a look at 40 studies um, with 1700 plus participants. And when they did a type of mobilization to the nerves themselves, it had a positive effect, a positive effect, excuse me, on neck pain, back pain, um, plantar fascial heel pain, tarsal tunnel syndrome. Um, they need more research on carpal tunnel syndrome, but it had a positive trend. This was another meta-analysis where they looked at 45 studies and neural mobilization specifically on the lower body quadrant. And what they showed is in healthy individuals, their flexibility improved. But in individuals with pain and disability, it had huge effects in decreasing their pain and disability. This I included in here because the question is, do nerves really slide and move? So they looked at both cadaver studies here and then with ultrasound live people and both putting a nerve into a slider or a tensioner. So slider is moving the joints in the same direction where a tensioner is moving in the opposite, the nerves moved. So both in cadaver and human life studies, they agree nerves move within their fascial sheaths. This was the disc study that I talked about um, where the, all the hernia discs were adhered to the dura mater of the nerve root and that um, when they put them into straight leg raise, there was ischemic changes and after the surgery, those changes changed. They improved blood flow and um, conduction. So that's the summary of these two. Actually, let me go, go back one. Um, the theory here, why I put the research in, because none of them are directly on the manual techniques that Dr. Baral uses. That's why I gave the patient examples for you. But the idea here is if nerves glide and slide, if nerves um, have compression on them, they lose blood flow and transport, but if we decompress them, that they improve that. Um, and that this, this study was shown that um, in cadavers, if they put a dye injected into the nerves and then moved them, that the cadaver, the dye would spread so that we do know that movement changes fluid flow. 
so that potentially if we can get the nerve to move and get it to slide and glide, we can improve blood flow and transport and function. And so the trends are that getting nerves to move can decrease pain, increase um, flexibility and improve functional scales. So I can tell you as a clinician using this work all the time in the clinic, um, starting at orthopedics and thinking I had good manual skills from the techniques I had learned um, along the way until I really learned some of this nerve work and how to very specifically treat the nerves and their surrounding structures in their fascial entrapment zones. Um, then I really started feeling like I was really improving patient outcomes in their lives and helping those patients heal themselves. So open to questions now from anybody that might have any questions. Yeah, I got a question, V. Yes. Um, so in a severely acute nerve pain type situation where you're not picking up with the listening any visceral issues, what would be the frequency that you'd recommend a treatment? So acute nerves, um, in, it depends on the work, but for the most part in the brawl work, when they're talking about treating these structures, whether it's visceral or neural, they usually like to give the body time to adapt from the treatment. Mm -hmm. So they usually suggest around three weeks. Um, I find depending on the patient, usually two to three weeks between treatments, Obviously, I, or I shouldn't say obviously, but I don't treat the same structure every time. So you might have to do a little bit of work around a really irritated nerve. And then the next time they're coming in, you're dealing with other mechanical things and giving them ways to change the compensations that they have from it. Cool. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Veronica, I have a uh, more of a comment. Mm -hmm. um, First off, that was awesome. Um, you really know your nerves. Um, that was um, quite impressive. I can definitely relate to uh, to what you're what you're talking about being very sort of sensitive, you know, gentle around the nerves. Um, we in my practices around the country, we do a lot of suspension training, offloading the body. And it's sort of that less is more type of um, approach where you might think, oh, you know, to, to really stimulate the nerves or regain neuromuscular control, you have to, you know, you have to really um, bear heavy weight or something through that, through that limb. But it's usually the opposite. The more that we offload them, you know, they're in an environment where their body lets go relaxes, but still challenges them just enough, like taking them right to that edge, like you were talking about with the palpation, just kind of right to the edge there without taking them too far where it backfires or with the rib manipulation that those other physical therapists had done prior to that patient coming to see you. So it's a lot of, so much of this is just getting them in the right environment. And I could see why your, your, your clients do so well, probably just the way that you speak is very um, healing. I think you probably put your clients in a, in a good environment that they feel like they're being properly supported, um, you know, to, to uh, feel like, like they can heal properly and, and um, uh, like without like a jackhammer type of approach. Right. So, so that's that a great, great feedback and great point. And I think, um, to give all of you credit, you're here trying to better yourselves. And what does that say that says about your intention? And so with anything that you're coming into, putting your hands on somebody and working with somebody or helping them, guiding them to help them heal themselves, again, that intention says everything about what you're doing. And so Dr. Baral is extremely humble and he always says, just do a little bit of something to help the body wake itself up and start its healing process. So most of the techniques, I didn't go into technique because I'm limited by what I'm allowed to share through this sort of platform. But I always tell my patients, they say, you barely touched it and I felt it melt and release and change. I always think of a bunch of necklaces tangled up or like your earbuds, right? Pulling on it harder doesn't work. But if you can push the ends together and allow it to soften and notice how it starts to innately sort of 
reorganize itself and detangle and then assist that process, whether it's through red cord and some suspension or Feldenkrais and guided gentle awareness or neural work or, 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 I'm not trying to leave anyone out. My brain just can't think of anything else right now. Um, all of that guided with that intention and care creates a different level of care. And that's what I'm hoping to do is it's not that you know, the nerve work is for everyone and everybody needs to take this. It's a tool and an access point that is another piece that if you're interested in this can go so nicely along with Feldenkrais and red cord and guided imagery and exercise base and nerve glides and things. But as long as it's done in a way that the body is the guide and you're not forcing it, I think is the beautiful part. Thank you. Any other questions or comment, comments or feedback? Um, excellent presentation, Veronica. And uh, it helps me understand the treatment I'm receiving from you, you know, more completely. And uh, thank you, really knowledgeable. And I gained a better understanding of the nervous system and tonight. Perfect, that was my hope. And if you're interested in taking these classes, email me, let me know because there's, there's early bird sign up discounts. Sometimes I can get other discounts. It just depends on what's going on. But if you're definitely interested um, and want guidance or you wanna know more about visceral manipulation or vascular or how to find a practitioner, um, just let me know. I try to be a guide for all of that. Any other questions? If they come to you later, you can email me, you can text me, you can call me. I'm happy to answer them. Um, and I'm so grateful for you all being here tonight. And if you're interested in presenting on Zoom more about what you do, um, I would love to do that and have you there and learn more from you. That's how I get better too. All right, well, if we're finished, then go ahead and just start signing yourself off and hopefully fingers crossed it recorded. That way, if you want to revisit it or share it, I'm going to post it on the Facebook page and make this available. That way you can share it with people and uh, patients or practitioners so that they have a better understanding of their bodies. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Thank you, Veronica. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye. See you all, I miss you. Bye. Bye-bye. We miss you too. Hi, Veronica. See you later. Thanks. Bye. Thanks, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thanks, Elizabeth. So did you want to stay the host, Veronica? Um.